the day. Um, we are going to spend the next hour expanding the power of our personal action. So sometimes we think personal action is all about uh, keeping your water bottle with you and making some changes at home. And in this section, it's going to talk about how we can expand our reach. So not only changes in our home, but changes to our work and communities as well. So often at the Carbon Almanac, we're asked, does individual action matter? And I want to say, yes, it does make a difference. We know that it will take companies to make systemic change. But last time I looked, every company, every city council, every, every government is made up of people just like you and I. And so our individual actions do make a difference. The Carbon Almanac was published about a year, almost a year and a half, two years ago. And it was created by Carbon Newbies, just like everyone in this room. There were 300 contributors across 90 countries, and the book came together in five short months. And that shows what the power of a, a number of individuals just mm -hmm. learning in the space and the impact that you can make. And the Carbon Almanac not only demonstrated what Carbon Newbies could do, but it's also a great resource for Carbon Rookies. The, the book is set up, and you can see some images here, to provide very short summaries about all things climate change. You can learn about the greenhouse effect, electric vehicles, e-bikes, and more. And it's all structured in the way you see here. Short articles, lots of graphics, lots of charts, and it gives you that great first step into the carbon space. In addition, there are a lot of free resources in the Carbon Almanac. If you go to carbonalmanac.com, you'll find the Almanac in Spanish, but also many other languages around the world. There's a kid's book that has been translated into 21 languages. And it's been interesting, the feedback that we've gotten on the kid's book, that it is not only a resource for kids, but it is equally good at introducing adults and getting kids to talk to their parents and grandparents about climate change. There are daily difference emails sent to your inbox every weekday, and you can sign up at the website. There's something called the Connect the Dots Action Guide. This is fabulous, and Anna will be talking about it a bit later in the hour. There's an educator guide. So anyone you know in your life that is a teacher, this is a fabulous resource. They can bring the Carbon Almanac into their classroom. There are also three different podcasts, one of which is called Carbon Sessions, and that is individuals talking about climate change. And with your own eyes is climate change in pictures with Getty images and just a beautiful collection of, well, I say beautiful, but it is also showing both, both what has been happening and also hope for the future. And then finally, a Climate Quest board game. So if you're looking for a fun game resource, it's available as well. And again, all at carbonalmanac.com. And many of you inside of your totes have a Carbon Almanac to take home with you. And with that, I am now going to take off the carbon off hat and put on a different hat. So uh, my name is Lori Sullivan, and I am the founder of One Shade Greener. In 2010, I started helping businesses and homeowners lighten their environmental footprint. And it's been interesting to kind of watch the space over the last 10 years. And when I participated in the Carbon Almanac, it really got me back to a place where I wanted to lean in even further and help those who were starting on their sustainability journey. And so in February of this year, I published a resource called One Shade Greener at Home for just that purpose, to help people quickly have a guide where they could find tips and ideas for their home, but also brands to consider. Because I found myself 
doing really well, but when it was time to purchase a product, I usually needed it right away. And the easiest thing to do is just revert to the brands you've already purchased. So I tried to include lots of ideas and choices um, as a resource. So when we registered for this event, we all did our climate footprint. Mine is 15.7. And we all start somewhere. I can guarantee that this number was probably close to 30 10 years ago. And now it's at 15.7. I'm making progress. I am not where I need to be. But I am making progress. And I think the challenge is that we could all stress out about how we compare. Others have higher numbers, lower numbers, and it becomes a bit of a competition. And instead, I think it's important to focus on our own journeys. Know your number and start making changes over time. And day by day, step by step, you will become one shade greener. I also am an advocate for starting at home. So I've done work with businesses, but like I said earlier, it, a business is made up of a lot of individual people, just like you and I. And your home is a, an awesome test bed. You can try things, see what works, see what doesn't work, and then you have a ripple effect. You can start taking what you're learning from your home to your workplace, to your neighborhoods and schools and beyond. So people ask, how do we get over the overwhelm and know where to start? When it comes to our carbon footprint at home, there are four key areas, home energy, transportation, food, and our spending habits. So I will cover a few ideas. I know that you've seen a number of them in the first hour. So starting with home energy, on a light green side, you can change your light bulbs to LED. Washing laundry in cold water can make a pretty big impact. And turn off your electronics when you're not in the room. As you move further to the right, you can do things like buying Energy Star appliances and programmable thermostats. And then finally, when it's time to make those larger investments in your home, you can look at things like windows and doors and energy sources. On the transportation side, obviously the greenest thing is to walk or bike where you go. When that's not possible, using public transportation or carpooling is a great idea. However, we all know that we are going to have to drive and there are moments when flights are needed. So when you do need to fly, choose coach over first class. And when you're driving, there's some tips like turning your vehicle off when you're waiting in a long line instead of sitting there with it idling. Driving less aggressively is uh, better for the environment and your fellow drivers. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also good to plan your errands. Don't decide every time you need to go out, oh, I'm gonna go to this store and then tomorrow I'll go to that one. Try to do one route and hit them all in one false swoop. And, you know, the pandemic has taught us that we can eliminate or remove commutes. So always looking for chances to work from home. That's not a solution, I know, all the time. But when it is, it's definitely beneficial. For food, the number one rule is consume food lower on the food chain. Avoid the processed food with all of the packaging. And Michelle showed earlier the impact of meat. So obviously removing meat from your diet is a very dark green move. If you can't go that far, you should at least consider things like Meatless Monday or cutting the amount of meat you eat during the week. Also avoiding palm oil and researching your coffee and chocolate. There's a big impact to our rainforests from those industries. So be conscious of what you're purchasing. And then on the food waste side, do your best to not purchase more than what you can consume and consider composting. For spending, there's a lot here and changing our spending habits is sometimes the most challenging. I mentioned one of those challenges earlier but we just live in a culture of more and keeping up with the Joneses and we need to push against that. 
We also can look at reuse, repurpose, and repair. And I actually have a video that I would like to show from Macy at Upstream to talk a bit more about reuse. Hello everyone, my name is Macy Zander and I work with Upstream. Upstream is a US-based nonprofit organization that sparks innovative solutions to plastic pollution by helping people, businesses, and communities shift from single use to reuse. The reality is we are currently living in the throwaway economy where 10% of all wood harvested, 20% of all aluminum mined, 40% of plastic created, and 50% of glass produced goes primarily to making single-use packaging that's consumed often in a matter of minutes before it gets trashed, recycled, or littered. It justifies the unnecessary extraction of precious natural resources on the front end while creating significant amounts of waste and pollution impacts on the back end. This system treats the resources of the planet and the communities that live on the fence line of the extraction, manufacturing, and waste facilities as disposable. If there's one thing we've learned at Upstream, it's that using products for just a few minutes before they become waste is not a sustainable form of consumption for a planet of over 8 billion people. That's why it's important to prioritize the focus away from disposables in the first place and instead emphasize waste prevention. I'm sure many of us have heard the three R's of reduce, reuse, recycle. Of course, recycling is important, but we need to reorient towards preventing all the waste from becoming generated in the first place, which is where prioritizing reuse and reduce comes from. So first, we need to focus on eliminating the unnecessary stuff and then transition as much to reusable and refillable formats. Once we've reduced and reused as much as possible, then we need to find the best ways to manage the waste. As one of our founders said, we're never gonna be able to recycle or compost our way to a sustainable future. We have to work upstream to redesign the systems generating all the waste in the first place. The reality is shifting to reusables is beneficial for the climate. In our work, we've discovered that using reusables over single-use foodware is a win on almost every environmental metric, including lowering greenhouse gas emissions. Reusables always hit a break-even point past a number of uses where they outperform the disposables, and the benefits to the environment accrue with each additional use past that point. So how can you support reuse in your everyday life? When you can, ask for real plates, cutlery, and cups, and use them when you're out as well as when you're at home. Getting coffee at your favorite cafe? Ask for a reusable mug. If your favorite eateries do use disposables, encourage them to make the switch to reusables. Businesses do love to hear from their customers, so kindly share that feedback with them. You can also remember to bring your own reusable water bottle and takeaway mug. Remember to bring your own reusable containers. Use your own bags and for produce as well as shopping. Shop the bulk aisle of your local grocery store or zero waste store and try to buy as unpackaged as you can. Use package free or reusable and refillable beauty and cleaning products. Support reuse businesses that are striving to make packaging a service rather than a product. If you're curious to know what reuse service providers are in your area, you can check out our business directory located on our website. And of course, progress is all about reducing the amount of natural resource extraction, energy use, and pollution required for human needs and desires. So most importantly, simply choose to consume less. Thank you. Okay, so to wrap things up, um, what I have found over the last 10 years is that what is good for the environment is usually healthier for the people in your home. And in most cases, it also lightens the impact on your pocketbook. So day by day, step by step, you can become one shade greener. And um, the QR code here, I have uploaded 
chapter nine, which is the kitchen from One Shade Greener at Home. And if you'd like to download it, I hope it can provide you even more tips and advice. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to 